All right, welcome everybody to the June 20th or to this architecture meeting. Make this a little bit bigger. Um, so just kind of pick up where we left off uh, from last meeting. So last meeting, we kind of identified some of the buckets for uh, the CD events. Uh, and what we need to kind of watch for or which events we're going to be interested in. And a long time ago, we had, I'll just go up to the top. We basically had a list of all the data that we, wanted, we want to uh, collect. Um, so today, today's thought was how do we map um, the data that we need over to a CD event? So um, in some of this stuff, uh, if you look at the other table that's further down, uh, some of it is supplied. So like the component domain, the component name, uh, that is kind of like supplied uh, data. Uh, and that will typically come from some sort of text file or markdown or YAML file in, uh, in the repo. So just to get us started, so like we need to know the component name and the component domain. So one of the things to do that is we need to, we need to have an event sent to us saying that the pipeline was started. Uh, once the pipeline started, we can get, we can find out things like what is the, the Git repo um, and the, the branch and the SHA and stuff like that. So that one is uh, where, and one of the things I did think about uh, in the last couple of days is um, initially we initially we talked about um, the everything being on a, a finished event. Um, let's say when a pipeline is finished, we go off and do something. When an artifact being published is finished, um, we go off and do something. But one of the things that we need to do is we need, need, need to actually create versions of the components in Ortelius before we can start associating things to them. So um, this that's why I changed the pipeline started. Um, so like the component name will be pipeline started. That one. Uh, the creation timestamp will be when a pipeline started. This is other data, the owner's file, security file, governance. Like I said, a lot of this is, is we get just, just out of the box when a pipeline is started. Now this one is interesting, um, the open API swagger. Um, one of the things we do in Ortelius is we actually go out as part of our build process, we actually generate the Swagger and the OP API from our Golang and Perl libraries. So this one, I'm wondering if we should have uh, in a, another event. So like we have the SBOM event. Um, let me go into here, it's easier to read. So we had like the, the S bomb being created, the deployment being created. Um, should we add one in here for creating uh, the creation of the the Open API and Swagger documentation, or could, or do you think we could just kind of attach that to one of the other ones that are out here? Does that make sense? The question. Yeah. Do you consider the uh, Swagger file an artifact in Ortelius? Uh, no, it is like a, uh, we consider it the same as like a readme file um, or a license file. It's not really like a, uh, a separate artifact the way Ortelius treats it. Um, so, and, and it doesn't, um, so let's say you if you have a, uh, like a, a smart bear running and you have like a whole, swagger documentation world out there that's out there on a separate server um, we don't account for that in this markdown that we're talking about does that help yeah so 
I'm kind of thinking we may need a new one because let's say the pipeline gets started, um, but the artifact creation hasn't been completed. Um, and the artifact creation is actually going to be the next thing that's used to um, generate the, the swagger. So um, in our in the Ortilis um, GitHub actions, one of the things that we do is uh, for some of the Python code, because of the way the Python swagger documentation is generated, we actually run run the microservice. Uh, and then we actually go and do a curl against the Swagger uh, endpoint to get the the Swagger JSON file. So I'm kind of thinking that we would need to add a new um, event. So that's does that yeah. work with everybody? Yeah, it makes sense. It will be the bridge in between. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so we want. Actually, let me do this. I'm going to mess up some of this stuff. I need to add a new option. There we go. Okay, so this one, we'll do the swagger finished. So this one is kind of a, it kind of goes, so this line is, um, I don't know if anybody's familiar with how Kubernetes does their, manages their access to the repos, but it's called, it's through this um, uh, YAML file called Parabolus, and there's a process that they go through um, that they actually manage all the repository access as code. Um, off of a, a, a YAML file uh, in the dot, it's usually in the dot GitHub repo. Um, I think this one will come from the pipeline started because we'll know the repo name and, and the repo org and stuff like that. Project contact, project website, issue tracking, security contact, all those are going to be like text files basically they're going to be in the repo or some information in the repo. So those will all be pipeline started. Uh, more repo stuff. There's a lot we get from the repo, surprisingly, that we can. Get commitment signing us based on that. Okay, code QL. Um, so code QL is, I'm trying to remember, code QL is like a, is a security scan, I think. Um, I'm trying to remember, it just runs in the background and I for, forget about it. <laughs> um, let's see, I think we had a group down here. So we, we actually put it under a tag called QA. Uh, last time. So mega linter, super linter, code QL, trivi. And I'm thinking we may need to get a little more refined in the, well, let's do, do the dependabot. I'd hate to, uh, like, dependabot and renovate are kind of like the um, dependency management tools um, for making sure your dependencies are up to date. And then like mega linter, super linter um, are different. Can somebody look up uh, what code QL does? I know, I can't remember. I know, so I think depend about, should we lint, should we group together 
the dependency management tools in the linting category or break them out? Did anybody have a, an answer on the code QL? Uh, yes, uh, it's an analysis for vulnerabilities. And I think that's what Sasha was mentioning in the last meeting. Um, I'm adding the link. Okay. So it's source code analysis. I'm going to put it under linter code QL. And I think for the Pendabot, I think we should add a new one for call it dependency management. So do that dependency management, renovate will be dependency management. So the salsa best practices, um, this one actually I think is going to come in when the pipeline has finished. So the idea behind the salsa best practices is, is part of the um, providence. Uh, you get you get to now uh, do some analysis on the um, the workflow to see if it had any if it's conforming to the best practices like an ephemeral build machine um, those type of things. So I think this one would be pipeline finished. Let's go ahead and add pipeline finished. We got a lot of vents out here, don't we? Command order. So pipeline started, pipeline finished. And this is one of the like salsa checks. I just put a couple out there as placeholders. Uh, SBOM generation. So I did put a SBOM creation finished. I think this row, I think we can delete that row. Now, the interesting thing is you can't sign until the s bombs been generated. So we could actually, instead of do, sending out another event for creation finish, we could actually wait for the other ones. But if they don't have signing, then we'll need that event. So what was this one? Signing finished. Yeah, we could leave it just like that for scalability in case they don't have it. But yeah, if they have it, it will be awesome because it will save time. Yeah, and that's going to be some of the when we actually um, start implementing the um, like this. So, for example, um, in the S bomb generation, so you can you can turn on a flag in, in your Docker build to um, have an SBOM automatically generated. So one of the things, so you get an SBOM, uh, it gets created as just a flag. Now, if we went out and um, updated the Docker build kit to automatically start pushing out these events for us and they, that those PRs got accepted, um, that tool would be publishing out uh, an SBOM creation finished event. 
but let's say we're doing a um, doing a PyPy build or Golang build that um, the S bomb is a separate step, um, like using SIFT or something, that we could actually get these S bomb creation events or multiple S bomb creation events from different locations. Um, so it is, I think it, it may be possible that we get two S bomb creation events for the same thing that we'll have to deal with, but I think that's just something down the road that we'll just have to keep in the back of my, our, our mind. Publishing events. Uh, so artifact published, finished. Same thing with the, the signing. I said, like I said, the Providence is going to be from the pipeline finished. Now, attestations are interesting because you can add, you can have like a, a, a Docker, as part of your Docker build, you can add in your own attestations. Um, basically, they're just fancy key, key value pairs. Uh, that you can add into your Docker image, but also there's going to be other attestations um, that can occur. I think it's usually going to be tied to provenance. So for now, I'm going to put under pipeline finished for us to go figure out, go derive the attestations. Uh, sonar cube, Veracode cube, those are kind of like, I'm going to lump those into security scanning tools. Or let's actually probably SAST would be better. Static code analysis. Come on, scroll. Linters, we should have linting in here. G the generic SAST and DAST. So, um, and this this one's actually interesting because the DAST um, uh, dynamic application static testing or whatever it's called um, is like zap proxy so they actually you have to actually start running the application and then start doing your dynamic testing after it so in the pipeline process it'll actually branch off and go some of these can take a couple hours to run um, in the background uh, in parallel so that's going to be interesting for one for us to uh, take a look at and we actually may need to do both. Uh, we'll have to see if we have to do the starting and finishing. Scorecard is all related to the um, pipeline to the Git repo. These are all pipeline stuff. Uh, Oops, yep, this is all pipeline stuff. Pipeline started. This is, this, these are all just the subcategories of, of uh, scorecard. Scorecard works off of um, the repo and a git commit. All right. So it looks like we, one, two, three, four. Looks like about 10 events uh, that we're interested in. And the big one being the, the pipeline started um, at that level. So that's going to be, I would say the, the pipeline started is going to be our, is going to be one of the places that we should put a lot of uh, work into broadcasting that event out. 
Now, uh, just to bring everybody up to speed, uh, I, don't, I don't quite know who's all on the call, um, but basically, um, the goal of all this, uh, all this, the, these events is to do it uh, passively without the need to update uh, any workflow files. So, doing this without having to update the um, your GitHub actions or Jenkins files. Uh, any of your, any of your GitLab stuff. Um, so some of this, um, if we look at pipeline started in the Jenkins world, we can actually go out and hit the Jenkins um, pull the um, Jenkins RESTful APIs to look for jobs that have started. Um, so it's not going to be perfect. There'll be a slight delay. Um, but we can actually do it passively uh, on that front. Same thing with uh, the GitHub actions. You can actually use the GitHub API and look at uh, workflow, workflow runs when they're, they're starting. Um, Aaron, do you know if, it, uh, if GitLab has something like that, a RESTful API to kind of talk to GitLab? It does have a, an API where you can talk to it. Um, doesn't do these particular types of events is part of that uh, API, but you can kind of query and do a get uh, on those APIs to determine those events. Yeah. So let me see. Um, so I have one out here. I had uh, I investigated. I, I'll run a lot of this stuff through. Chat GPT just to see, uh, make sure I'm not crazy. Uh, da, 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 da. Megalinter. So, like, one of the things I was looking at was code to look at the GitHub Actions RSS feeds. Um, for a repo, so you can actually um, go to the RSS feed uh, and um, oh, I, I remember what this one was. So this was, you know, in, in GitHub, you can um, have a, you can be notified through email if something happens to the repo. Um, so one of the ideas I had was you go in and uh, subscribe to a GitHub repo um, for a particular like service account, um, and then that service account has some email uh, associated to it. And whenever something happens on that repo, that notification will get sent over via email, and then we just sit there and read email. And based on that, we would go out and kick out. Uh, like the pipeline started event. It's a roundabout way to get there. It was just one of the ideas uh, that I was looking at on that front. Yeah, it's not a bad idea. It, it It's a, it's simple. <laughs> yeah. You know, and not a lot of uh, work on that front. Let me see. You can tell I use ChatGPT a lot. <laughs> I could have sworn there was one in here. Count PRs. I wish I could filter this. But anyways, there was another um, sample I had. I'll have to hunt it down on uh, polling Jenkins and polling uh, the GitHub's using their APIs. Um, any other metadata that we may be missing? If we can just take a quick browse through this. And again, a lot of this um, data, uh, not all the data here can be derived. Some of it has to be supplied. Uh, even that supplied data, if we can uh, say this would be 
um, you know, the governance stock for an open source project. Not all open source projects will have it, but it's something that we can grab if it does exist. Same thing with like code of conduct, CLA. The only thing I didn't uh, get into would be, we have the issue tracking, but um, what's that uh, I'll ask into as a confluence, kind of the project management aspect of it. Do we think that would be of interest as well to, to know? Oh, and then on the flip side, uh, like PagerDuty, um, ServiceNow, those type of, of links as well. Should we include those as some of the metadata that we're looking for? Google for scalability, not immediate use because not everyone used them, but it would be a good practice to follow just in case. Yeah, okay. I'll put them down to the bottom here. So, I don't know what the group of as, we'll just do service. What is that, like help desk? Incident management. Thank yeah, you. incident management, like Jira. Yep. Yeah. Service now. Uh, Pager duty. And then the other one. Let's see. Project planning, is that what it's called? Yeah, planning or project management. Yeah, yeah or, management. Or, pro or project. I'll like Asana and Monday? Yeah. Yeah, management. What was another one? Asana. Asana, Monday. Nice spell close. <laughs> I never use those. So I, I, I know they exist. <laughs> and yeah, I, same. I, I, I'll to Excel. <laughs> Good old Excel. Yeah. Um, all right. Any other things we want to know about. It's a pretty long list, but like I said, a lot of it comes from uh, the beginning of the pipeline, so, which is a good thing. Yeah, because that's the tedious thing. Yep, yeah. That's the best for us in the workflow. Yeah, and, it, and I think if we get that part sorted out, um, so like uh, like Jenkins, um, on the Jenkins side, a pipeline started, they do have a, a plugin that you can install and turn on and configure um, for the pipeline, you know, to kick out these events. Um, but what we want to be able to do is have the, or uh, not necessarily have the Jenkins administrators start doing that, but again, watch everything passively uh, so we can start gathering this data without having people config configure stuff. All right. Any other questions on our events? Okay, cool. We're gonna change gears over to the UI. Just throw that as a placeholder. So um, one of the things I was curious about on the UI layout, um, so this is just my uh, Google uh, stuff running for uh, our Kubernetes cluster. So one of the things I was curious about is if this 
sidebar, which has seemed to be pretty popular. I went back and looked at some of the websites that we were looking at for examples. Um, that it was like 50 50 so some of these a lot of them had the, the menu bar uh and like you know doing the collapsible uh, of course i pick the wrong one that i don't have implemented um if that menu bar is going to work okay or if we should go with the filter thing so we look at Docker Hub. So I think with the different types of data that you have and data points, you probably want the sidebar. Docker Hub is has this filter, but it's really specific to just the Docker images, right? Yeah. So in one type in, of data. It, it, exactly. It is well, yeah, the the types of data that we have, um, we're going to have um, basically your your components, um, applications, which are made up of components, uh, environments, which are, are where applications are deployed to, and then um, let me see what else I got. Uh, domains, users, and groups. So these are like the the high level um, ones that we have, and we could possibly do it. You know, a combination of both if we think that would work, um, or like I said, just go to this um, the side menu. Thoughts on that? I kind of like the side menu just because it's more common and easier to navigate. Yeah. All right. Cool. That yeah, was my for accessibility. It will be fine because it's easiest to access. It's not too many steps in between how the user interacts with it. Yep. And then, um, so I put an issue out there. Let me see if I hit. Yeah. So I think on this, what we need to do, I, I basically put an issue out there. Arvin, um, who's not on a call today, was looking for some front end work. Um, so the nice thing with this is you have the collapsible um, menu. It's weird how it works. You float over and expands. So something like that, I think is, uh, is, is handy uh, to get some more real estate especially when you get familiar with what the icons are. Yep. So I, I was going to have him investigate uh, how to do this. Yeah, um, GitLab has also gone to that kind of model of using that collapsible um, sidebar as well. Yeah, what does GitHub do? I don't even remember. <laughs> even though I'm on, I'm on GitHub all the time and I just uh, So they do the tile thing with the search which I think is annoying. They do it across the top. Yeah. Let me go into the, but. Let me go into a commit. Oops. Come on. Go into a specific commit. Yeah, so when they go into a specific commit, they're using all the real estate. So I think that's why they moved it up here. Um, yeah. And they they have the float over. They so they do a hamburger menu a little bit differently with the the float over. Yeah. Th thoughts. I think I still like the this one. 
That's yeah, just my... I mean, we could ship the place uh, of the sidebar like they did, but it will be more confusing because it will be presenting another change to the end user. So the easier it is, the better. So yeah, I'm cool with that one. Cool with the sidebar versus yeah. the the top bar. Yeah, this yeah, looks that this, seems better. this seems a little dated to me. Yeah, Saren said uh, the trend is just to collapse everything, but you keep having everything outside. So that will be either your left or your right. Right. Let me go back to that one. It's one of the interesting things they do do here once it loads come on google we have to make sure this doesn't happen <laughs> um they do do the, the the tab thing across the top and they do have actions up here so it doesn't mean that we can't do this stuff um but i think just overall navigation that we want to do the, the the side navigation bar okay cool yeah yeah because those will be our higher level topics as tracy was telling so those yeah. will be more immediate actions so it makes sense yeah okay cool so going to Was that it called a collapsible left side bar? Uh, versus the top menu bar. Okay, cool. All right. What's that issue number? Okay, I'm gonna assign that to Arvin for him to give us an example to see if Svelte, Svelte can do it. Uh, should be able to. So um, one of the things that you'll, uh, in the issue, I talk about the uh, material UI. So so material UI was created by Google and it, it has a bunch of um, research that they did on uh, how components should be uh, laid out. And if you ever go and look at the material UI, they get into uh, the reasoning behind things. So they actually go through and, and say that this header should be eight pixels from the edge of the border for this reason. I mean, it's really in depth on uh, the research that they did on how to make the uh, websites useful. So I think there should be 
app bars maybe. Oh, there's the app bar that we we're talking about uh, earlier. So one of the things that we want to do is make sure that we um, kind of uh, stick to uh, the material UI objects and not go off and invent any new ones. It just will make our lives a lot easier. Yep, agree. So I'm sure in here there's going to be banner. I know accordion will be. So here's the accordion. So it may be an accordion that's used to create the menu bar on the left. We'll have to see how uh, that happens. I can't remember what banner is. Oh, the scrolling top banner. But I think um, if we focus around these objects, um, that there's enough thing, enough objects here that we won't have to um, uh, invent any or go get some weird jQuery uh, object. So I'll let, uh, so these are the buttons, cool. So I will um, assign that to Arvin. And we'll get going on that front. All right, those are the two uh, big things that I had on my uh, list. Uh, anything else that we need to cover? Um, from for your UI, have you discussed um, mobile first or approach to this or no? We did not get into mobile um, uh, and discuss that area. Uh, it is a good topic. Uh, so the question on mobile first. Um, typically, I think most people will be using um, Ortilius in the reports and stuff like that from work. So I don't know how much mobile is going to come, mobile first coming into play. Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, so I was thinking I'd more tablet um, size. Um, you, you may be using it from work or most people work in IT work from home these yeah. days. So tablets are very popular in that space. Okay. You're saying Elizabeth? Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, I don't want to interrupt. I had, um, yeah, I was thinking like, if they're going to use Mainly or Tilius at work, then it will be a desktop uh, setup. So for resolution, we should use uh, use the responsive design that will be previously configured for either a tablet or a mobile without losing too much visibility, which the sidebar menu will help us with. Right. Yeah. Resolution. And I guess who is the main target audience? Are you looking at execs? Or are you looking at developers and people who are down in the weeds on a daily basis? On or, the or in between, on the daily basis, it will probably be uh, DevOps engineers and security folks. So I guess in that case, I would also include mobile phones, because if you're looking at DevOps and SRE people who get a zero day notification, they need to go look, query something, and they may not be at their desk. Okay. In that case, it will be just a specific view of yeah. the user interface, not 
the hole. So right. that could be kind of like what Splunk does, uh, just precisely for the notifications. Right. Yeah. yeah, specific for notifications and probably for the component because they would want to search to find that component and then see if it does exist in their environment or not. Yeah. the line here so we have the other secondary audience I want to say secondary um, I'll put zero day and then obviously we'll have um, the secondary audience Uh, will be um, kind of like directors and up or project managers. And those will probably be, uh, I'm guessing that's going to be on a more reporting. Yeah. Reporting and maybe a dashboard view. Um, you know, how bad good are we doing? Zero day needs, and this will be mobile. Okay, cool. And I think um, if I remember correctly, responsive is built into the material UI and Svelte. By yeah, default. because they use the same uh, when they did you the Android layouts and um, is the same with CCS and HTML. They have the measures for each given resolution of the yeah. screen you want to try. So it shouldn't be a problem. Yeah. Oh, and that reminds me. Uh, so, default resolution to to tablet, maybe. Okay, anything else on mobile or desktop? Well, I, the only follow-up to that would be uh, PWA or SPA architecture. Um, what do you mean by that? So the single page application um, is for if you want to have something that's more mobile, typically the progressive web app that you can, you, most browsers and phones, even I think iOS recently supported it, although they go back on it. There's Apple's the only one that <laughs> is questionary there. They go right. back and forth on PWAs. Um, but uh, so with PWA, you could, rather than having a specific app for your mobile devices or your tablets for the iOS store or for the Android store, the PWA gives you that kind of um, way to install it without actually having to go through a particular store. It's really right. just to the, the web app, really. Right. So uh, what does PWA stand for again? Progressive web app. Page web single app. page application is kind of what most desktop apps are geared towards or have been for the last five years or so. Right. And the, um, I'd have to look to see how uh, Svelte does it. 
I remember um, based on their so Svelte has um, so Svelte is built on top of uh, Vite which is built on top of uh, React basically. They're all, it ends up being a React derivative down the road, um, if I remember correctly. And in the Svelte kit, there is a way to do both of these. And one was easier than the other. It had to do with the page routing um, of the data between the pages. Um, so, is there a preference, PWA there's, versus SWA? There's pros and cons for each. Um, the primary pro for the PWA is for the zero day people and the mobile uh, and kind of the convenient stuff it gives with mobile devices, tablets and whatnot. Right. SPA is more general purpose, but it does have its limitations when you start to get into the mobile world to a degree and that limitation just being that you don't have a quick way to access it um, it does look like spelt does um, have the ability to do both yeah that's what i remember um i'd have to like i said i had to go and look at the I knew the capabilities exist, but I remember looking at one was going to be harder than the other one um, yeah, in in the in the implementation aspect of it. Yeah, I think it's called a router. Yeah, and because with PWA, the primary thing that you really want to look look at is offline connectivity and how do you do stuff on mobile because you may or may not always have a connection to the internet yeah and we can put some um a guy um guardrails around this to say that um we're not going to we're not going going to develop a uh, a mobile app per se that we would have somebody download and install right. from uh, a marketplace, but we are going to have a, a web page friendly, <laughs> you know, uh, a mobile friendly web page, put it that way. Right. Yeah. That's the other way to get around it. There may be more work involved with the PWA just because of the offline aspect that you have to think about. Yep. Because so I think if we get into a separate mobile app, we're going to be we're going to have two. We're going to bite off too much to chew. Yeah, it's good for long term, but it could be an improvement to what we have. Migrating shouldn't be that hard. It would have the basis covered. And the responsive design that we have worked so far will help with that. Right, exactly. And that's prim primarily why I was asking what the primary target is in your target audience. Yeah, I think we've identified um, that the the zero day with the some specific requirements um, makes sense, uh, and we may need to uh, build this you know solidify this list better uh, down the road um, in the next couple weeks. Um, but if we have a a a good responsive um, page 
that will work on a tablet, I think that will get us pretty far. That's just my personal opinion. Yep. Okay, uh, any other things on that? All right, cool. All righty, we got two minutes left. Any last words? Um, next time, um, so based on all this stuff, uh, all the data that we're uh, collecting, um, I think the next time we should look at the actual metrics um, aspect of it. Because so this is like all the metadata that we're going to be gathering. Um, the next thing would be to look at the metrics around this. So, for example, some of the metrics I could think of is um, just like on SBOM. Okay, so how many projects or components out there are, are generating SBOM? So you have, you know, 50% of your applications are generating a, an SBOM. Then based on, uh, you know, which is a good metric to, to kind of gauge how your organization is, is doing. Now, the next level that we can um, do with that, that SBOM data is saying how many packages that are, that we're depending upon are, have overlap. So, for example, we're going to use the Python click library is is going to be a, is a very common library in our Python applications or, you know, in Golang, maybe it's a net HTTP library, um, you know, so we can have those type of metrics uh, as well. Other metrics. So we have like uh, um, some count metrics and then at kind of like a project level. But I think that's something that we're going to need to really uh, drill down into uh, and solidify because that will then kind of drive what our dashboard uh, is going to look like uh, for our our initial landing page. Um, you know, when you first first bring up the Ortelius, what's the metrics data that you're going to look at? Um, and the metrics are, will change view based on um, if you're looking at it from an organizational level, you know, how is my company doing? versus a division versus a, a project team uh, type of aspect. So just put that in the back of your mind um, that that will kind of be the next step uh, that we need to focus on. Make sense? Yep. Yep, just as we were before, yeah. And those metrics are that is that something that can kind of glean from existing deploy hub users or uh yeah we have an idea uh we have a pretty good guess of what the the metrics are and some of it stems from like dora metrics uh if you think about that world yeah. uh you know so like um so like an interesting metric that we, one of our customers wanted us to track was how many, this project team has 12 committers um, associated to it. And out of those 12 committers, we're only getting eight, eight people actually doing commits. And this was uh, an interesting metric because those 12 committers were uh, cons uh, a consulting company that they're paying for. 
So they're actually paying for 12 people to do work, but in the end run, they're, they're only getting you know 75%. So they're being overcharged by 25% because they're not getting everybody doing work on that front. So that was an interesting metric that we ran into. Um, it's trying to keep people accountable. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. It, it's it, it's actually um, a government agency, uh, a state government. Huh. So, um, so they wanted to know whether they're, they're getting their money for, for what they're paying for. <laughs> In other words. Right. So, already. So, think about metrics for next time. Okay. <laughs> for sure. And again, we have a, a lot of a lot of data that we're collecting on the metadata side. So, um, a lot of this will be end up being percentages. You know how many percentages of your projects out there have uh, two-factor authentication enabled? You know, those type of things. Um, how many projects are doing, uh, are signing their commits? How many commits are being signed out of everything? You know, so those would be some of it, um, but uh, once you dive deeper into it, um, you know, like the commit signature, or what was the other one? Artifact signing. If I find artifact signing, you know, on, I can't find it right now, but in our artifact signing, how many artifacts are being signed by cosign self signing versus how many artifacts are being signed with a public key, public private key pair? Those type of things will uh, come into play uh, out there. It's basically we're, we're going to try to do is, you know, try and overall goal would be is how well are we doing <laughs> and, and how much work do we have left to do? <laughs> yep. All righty. We're over by a few minutes. Thank you so much. Um, and we'll talk next time. Yep. Thank you. All right. Have Thank a good you, one, everybody. Man.